So, um, I shall begin. Um, that was a wonderful introduction. Um, let me uh, introduce myself. Um, um, Robert Arnold, uh, I generally go by the name Bob, but um, uh, sort of officially in correspondence, uh, it seems like everyone likes to, prefers to call me Robert. Um, I am a professor of film at Montana State University, um, up someplace very far from here. And uh, I'm a filmmaker and a film theorist. Um, uh, I started working in filmmaking uh, around 1980. Um, and um, I'm going to mention some things about this sort of early background because it's, um, I think, related to how my work has recently developed. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, some of the themes and concerns, preoccupations uh, in uh, my work, sort of looking back as my work has developed. Um, but I'm, I, I, I think there's an underlying theme here uh, that's become sort of recently evident to me that um, I think I'm trying to work my way back to uh, some very uh, early ideas I had, um, and I, hopefully that will sort of become clear as I uh, move forward. Um, but I want to preface this by saying, you know, I was invited to present um, a master class, uh, and I find that idea very uh, humbling and intimidating. I don't really feel like I've mastered uh, anything, um, and although I've been teaching film for um, over 30 years, I still feel like I'm struggling to understand what it is that I'm doing and what I'm uh, concerned with. And um, especially after the very interesting class yesterday evening, the lecture on um, uh, artificial intelligence um, and looking at cutting edge developments in uh, technology and extending them into filmmaking techniques, um, I, I really uh, uh, want to give you sort of a warning um, that this is a very low-tech uh, presentation. And my uh, filmmaking um, uh, process, I think, has sort of uh, been uh, regressing into lower and lower forms of technology rather than higher and higher forms of, of technology. I think, uh, as we'll see as I get to talking about a more recent film uh, that was in the festival last year uh, that I'll be focusing on, that I'm, I'm trying to return uh, my filmmaking practice to something uh, that I started with as a um, studying visual arts before I started working in film, and that was simply drawing, the idea of drawing as a um, mode of observation, as a mode of perception, uh, and as a, uh, a process. Um, uh, so um, as my artwork developed, um, oh, I'm one slide at, well, behind you, so um, we're ahead of you. Okay, there's a low tech warning. Um, so as my work um, has developed, I mean, from the beginning, I was very interested in uh, the idea of process. So that's going to be a, something I'm going to be sort of focusing on in this. And by the way, my teaching style is very casual. So if you, anyone has any comments or questions at any point, um, please feel free to shout them out. I'd be happy to respond. Um, so, um, you know, moving forward here, the idea of process is something that's informed my work, and it's something I've struggled with uh, in filmmaking. Uh, earlier on, when I was um, working in drawing, printmaking, and sculpture um, as the media that I was particularly interested in, I was uh, very attempting always to maintain some evidence of the working process in the finished product, whether it be tool marks or uh, traces of erasure or uh, overdrawing, uh, so that um, the work would seem, uh, even to the viewer after the fact, it would still seem to be something that was um, still becoming, that there was some evidence or traces of the process that led to it. I always have preferred, uh, even as a viewer of art, I've always preferred drawing sketches to paintings. I've always looked at painters 
preliminary sketches, and I found them always more interesting than the paintings that, they, that resulted from them, because they were always indicating something that was tending towards something, um, a, a work in progress that I found very interesting. So part of what I'm going to be doing is trying to connect that idea uh, to filmmaking and show how it's um, sort of uh, unfolded for me. Um, but uh, when my, I started working in film, um, I became fascinated by um, something that we're all very familiar with, um, and that is the basic uh, illusion of motion that uh, successive still frames can produce. I still find that, I'm sort of fixated on that, and I still find that a very interesting phenomenon uh, on a number of levels. Um, so it's uh, not anything terribly new that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and the techniques that I'm going to be talking about, I think, are going to be fairly familiar uh, to most of you. Um, but as I started working in film, uh, there was one film in particular that really um, sort of um, highlighted this interest I have uh, and started me thinking uh, in a new direction. And that was this film from 1974 by Gary Baylor called uh, Pasadena Freeway Stills. Is anyone, are, is anyone familiar with this film? It's a sort of classic, uh, early uh, kind of American experimental structuralist materialist film. Um, it's a very interesting film in that um, uh, if you, I have the film, but I, I don't know if I, I don't have a legal copy of the film, so I hesitate to show it to you. It's a six minute film. Yes, yes, you can show it. I can show it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I, I will set it up by simply saying, uh, you see uh, a person sitting behind a fixed camera, uh, or in front of a fixed camera, I should say, who is successively moving and placing on a glass plate um, images, still images, that were printed frame by frame from a film that was shot driving through the Pasadena Freeway Tunnel in California. And as he's placing and then replacing each one of these frames, the film starts losing frames in that action until it reaches the point where each individual frame that is being placed is there for one frame, uh, and now that image becomes an animated image but the framing action is destroyed in the process. Until then, frames are added back in when it returns to the normal cinematic time with him placing the images. So, yes, let me uh, switch over to that. Uh, no sound. Uh, not on the screen? Okay. So, uh, there's a way to do this. And I think I'm just going to do it this way. Okay. No, there is no sound. So you notice the cut that starts to yes. appear and the cut gets, the number of frames being removed increases with each frame that he's placed, each shot or still that he places, until it will eventually reach the state of becoming a moving image. So I've become very interested in this 
this process of the threshold of the still becoming a moving image, moving from still to motion, and the effect that then has on the presence of the still image. The still image is erased in the process of it becoming a moving image. And the two modes of perception, if you will then, are incompatible. Um, the mode of the still and the mode of the moving image are incompatible modes of seeing an image. And of course, then the, the movie camera is, of course, a misnomer. It's a, um, it's not a, it's not a camera. It's not a device that records motion. It's a device that that destroys motion, that converts motion into still images. So, seeing this as an impressionable art student filled with, um, you know fervor for uh, purist, structuralist, materialist filmmaking, Peter Godal and so on. I was, um, yeah, this was the aha moment that I needed to sort of move from sculpture to filmmaking. Mm -hmm. um, my sculpture had been uh, developing as a, uh, kind of inspired by a, um, Anthony Caro and other sort of structuralist kind of sculptors, um, a lot of parts that were held together quite tenuously with very visible connections like big bolts and things to suggest some dime, even though it was a static, steel, heavy thing, it, it suggested some tension, some dynamic tension in its being something whole, made up of parts that were always ready to separate into their individual components. And I've always thought that that's what eventually led me to film, that film was a similar kind of idea, that, that parts became something else through a process that made them into a new whole. Um, but as I, as I moved towards very recent filmmaking, I realized, um, I, I think that either um, the, the idea of drawing, too, is something that has been present in my work, or it's something that I'm now actually working back towards, as I will continue to talk about. So, um, yeah, and again, the frames start being replaced so that the moving image inscribed within the black and white still images returns to, um, it, it passes through that threshold where you start to now see that as still images as the framing action starts to become reconstituted as moving images, so uh, the two. So, nothing I'm going to show you is as good as that. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but uh, it's like, you know, one of those films that you just wish you had made. Uh, but I didn't. Sorry. And he'll get up and walk out as he walked in. So, good short film strategy. Uh, uh, just uh, so. Um, let's see if I can reconstitute my PowerPoint. Okay. So, um, as I these ideas were developing in, in my at my. I was moving from thinking about sculpture to thinking about film and starting to work with film. Um, I was also doing something that I thought was an unrelated activity at the time. I was collecting a lot of pop cultural kitschy stuff. Uh, and in particular, um, a genre of postcards that, that I don't think is necessarily unique to the United States, but is very closely 
um, associated with the United States, and that's what we call the highway or travel postcard. That sort of um, uh, represents the, I, the uh, development of a, the car culture in the United States, our love of car travel. Um, it's, uh, in particular, there's an era of these postcards in which um, the pictures are not of a destination you might reach with your car, but rather simply the view looking out of the car down the highway. That is sort of the experience of driving itself. And I was collecting these. And as I was thinking about um, film uh, at the time, I started to think about this collection of images um, as being very similar to the frames of a film. The frames of a film have to be very similar to one another. They have to be highly redundant. The information has to be, I don't know what percentage from frame to frame has to be practically the same. The difference is fairly minor from frame to frame in order for them to become a moving image. And there were so many of these images that were so similar, I started to imagine the possibility that they could function as the frames <coughs> of a film. Um, and I also started to imagine that maybe um, in our consumption of these mass-produced uh, popular uh, commodities, like postcards, we were actually slowly processing a movie that was imprinting itself uh, upon us as part of the kind of uh, culture becoming defined increasingly by visual media and, and so on. So I, I started to play with these uh, postcards as um, in, a, in a mode like a flip book to see if I could move between the still and the moving image. But I wanted a goal, I wanted to, because the postcards themselves had such a unique identity. Each, each one of these was not just an image that has its own identity, but was actually an artifact of history. Um, these postcards that I collected had been written on the back, addressed and stamped, and they were often had postmarks on the image side, or they were worn, uh, they had been, they have a kind of uh, identity as a, something that has moved through time, even though it's a still image. And so I wanted to achieve something um, in translating this into a film. Uh, this film was made in 1991. Um, uh, that achieved a sense of motion, but not at the expense of the identity of the still images that constituted the frames that produced that illusion of motion. I was trying to achieve something right on that threshold that allowed for the simultaneous perception of still images and moving images. So, um, uh, it, that turned out not to be that difficult. Um, I'll just show you those three or four frames um, as a movie here. If it were a look. So, um, it may or may not convince you that um, I achieved my goal, that you would see simultaneously something that seemed like it was actually moving, but at the same time, uh, without losing the identity of the, and, and, and very important um, for the viewer of this film and another film I'm gonna talk about next, to recognize what these images were, not just what they depicted, but that they were postcards, that they were artifacts of popular culture that existed in that realm, to be familiar with them. Um, so just as another example of that, um, and this shows a, a sort of challenge that I realized uh, that I encountered in the making of this film that I, I, I hadn't anticipated. Uh, to achieve the sense of motion, uh, I had to organize the cards, not by their geographic referent. I mean, all these travel cards say somewhere, either on the front of the card or on the back, this is some place. This is, you know, the Pennsylvania Turnpike, or this is, um, you know, some road in the Rocky Mountains. It, they're, they're geographically specific. But for me, uh, to arrange them as the stills of a movie, that didn't really matter. What mattered was the visual correlation from image to image. A, you know, the, think of that as the sort of indices of motion, that something uh, smaller in the distance in one card would become slightly larger in the next card and then slightly larger and therefore closer in the next card and so on. So you can sort of see the idea of moving through a tunnel. 
But of course, you know, this is an exercise in creative geography and montage as well, because um, none of these tunnels are the same tunnel. Uh, and, but that was, of course, necessary to create that sense of motion that I just simply had matching uh, between the cards. But apparently it confused some people who recognized the locations and saw the contradiction between, you know, that I wasn't following a, ge a truly representational geography. Um, which for me was never the least bit interesting or relevant uh, because um, I, I didn't think I was dealing with a, anything that was actually referential. Because postcards, if they refer to anything, they refer to our imaginary conception of the United States and travel and that uh, through that environment. It's a sort of the mythical representation of the United States. If you come to see the film uh, in my screening tomorrow night, you'll see I don't have examples of it here, but the, the uh, when you travel through places like Texas, you'll see the cattle punching jackrabbits, for example, cowboys riding rabbits that are as big as horses, which don't exist. But in our mythology, they do. You know, everything, the mythology is that everything is big in Texas. So the rabbits are also big. Um, so there's, there's a lot of this referentiality to something completely non-representational. But uh, it did confuse some people. I had never, when I made this film, I made this film when I was in Iowa in graduate school. I started making the film then. And um, I grew up on the East Coast. And I had never been west of Iowa, which is about in the middle of the United States, traveling from east to west. So the movie in the end was a, constructed as a road movie driving from New York to LA. Um, and I had not been to most of the places that the postcards depict. And again, so it was never it was very much a, a sort of exercise in portraying a imagined landscape. So um, the tunnel sequence, just to give you a little taste of that. So the film was um, fairly easily made. Um, the postcards, I filmed them on an uh, animation stand. Um, a, few number, depending on how fast I wanted to be driving or looking at something, uh, uh, the number of frames I exposed each card. And, um, oh, I didn't set that one up to loop, sorry. And, what are we hearing? Oh, the music outside. Yeah. Um, and so, um, what was I saying? Um, I forgot. Oh, uh, the process. So, uh, and there was a one frame dissolve, essentially. I, I double exposed the transitional frame to sort of help the blending process. The really challenging part of making the film, which is a 15 minute film, was finding all the postcards to create the sequence. And that actually necessitated, I moved way beyond my, what started as a very small collection and, and, and contact people who were actually committed, dedicated, postcard collectors and actually I had to travel all over the country to uh, find these collectors and borrow their postcards so I could fill in all the gaps that were needed. How many postcards? Oh my god, in the end it was something like um, 18, 1800 or something or something. You, you, when I get to the, um, a later film it's, it gets up to the numbers get up to like 40, uh, 50,000. But um, it was so and this Several you, hundreds. <laughs> did you use it all, or uh, you, you make selection? Um, I did. Um, I, I did shoot more. Than, I mean, uh, then I sort of. Did, I had a lot of sequences of moving sequences, yeah. uh, and I had a, at one point in a rough cut. I had a thirty-minute film, oh. and it just was you know too much. Too much. You know, you just don't need to pass everything. Um, so it, I, did, I wanted it to be more of a you know a compact film as well. Right. Um, so, um, jumping ahead a little bit, I had in mind the same idea that um, these popular, these mass-produced popular cultural images um, that have a high degree of redundancy uh, lend themselves to this kind of treatment. And I, I, I was no longer able to not see their potential as a moving image. So, um, I found myself one day, uh, and this is actually a true story, um, it sounds made up, but it's a true story. I was in the grocery store, pushing my cart down the aisle, and there's a display of, not, of books on one aisle, 
And uh, often the uh, romance novels, what we call romance novels, the Harlequin romance novels, they're familiar with that. I think they call them different things in different countries, but uh, um, uh, these pulp romance novels. Um, uh, often were ha had the covers facing out as they do in grocery stores to catch your eye so you'll want to buy them. And I never, uh, nobody believes me, but I've never read any of these trashy books. Um, but I became, I noticed the covers as I was pushing my cart down the aisle that were so similar. Always a couple, always posed at some seeming important moment of either coming together or perhaps coming apart. Very, in a very small space that they occupied. And I imagined that if I pushed my cart down the aisle at a certain rate and blinked as I went by, I'd see the move. So I said, okay. So the rest of my, the next five years um, of my life was spent collecting these book covers. Um, and I particularly, I became really fond of the ones made in the 1960s and 70s, more than the more recent ones. They had certain characteristics that I liked. And what you discover when you start looking at something differently, um, I was amazed. Uh, you'll notice just in this almost random selection that not only is there a high degree of redundancy in the composition, but it's like three models. And I found like there are really only two males for 15 or 20 years of these covers. Uh, one dark, sort of Latin looking, one blondish, sort of Germanic looking, and they come in a, a younger and an older version. But it's the same dudes in all of them. And maybe there's eight different women. And of course they're all white and they're all heterosexual, but there's a little bit more variation among the women. And the other thing I noticed that was amazing, interesting to me, um, was that the guy's always approaching her from behind. And she's making eye contact with the viewer, who's the presumed female reader, probably. And he's sneaking up on her from behind in a kind of vaguely threatening, scary way. Uh, because many of the novels, the narratives are about being swept off one's feet through a chance encounter. So there's that. A uh, weird kind of dynamic of the visual, <coughs> this spectator position relative to these images and gender and so on. So I started collecting these to see if I could achieve something similar. Again, to achieve a sense of motion, in this case, not moving through a space, but rather bring the, the, the couple into a moving, living sort of interaction that explored the limited relationship that they have. One of the things I discovered is that they never actually do kiss on the covers. They get really close sometimes. That's about the closest I've ever seen to a kiss. Most of the time it's sort of like either that moment is like several frames away or as Roland Barth pointed out about the still photograph, you don't know if it's like the moment before the kiss or the moment after the kiss. So I got this idea in my head that this was it was either always just before or just after, but never actually that moment. So I was going to explore that dynamic. Am I running out of time? I don't know. So give you a little taste of this. Um, so the title of the film is The Morphology of Desire, of course. I was interested in Freud's ideas about the um, uh, ultimately unsatisfiable desire that keeps us going. Um, uh, and also keeps us buying romance novels uh, that only give us a momentary partial satisfaction, just like kissing does, that will eventually you know, resurface in a new form. Um, so um, here you have... Um, <laughs> so this is just um, a... Uh, I, I found that the sequencing and the technique of filming just the sequence did not achieve the effect that I wanted. Uh, and this was... Um, you know, around uh, 1994, 1995. Um, so I, I got into, I, I, I spent some money and bought um, one of the early um, it, the digital image morphing uh, software programs that was being used in the film industry. And it was uh, being prevalently used at this time 
But um, morphing was used predominantly in movies and in advertisements and in music videos to change, transform something into something else. There was a music video in which a, either a sexy woman becomes a guitar for the rock player to play or the guitar becomes a sexy woman, I can't remember. And there was a famous a music video of Michael Jackson quite ironically becoming a Black Panther. Yeah, right? You see that? Yeah, by Steven Spielberg. Yeah. Yes, and so um, I use it somewhat differently, not to transform something into something else, but to simply bring something into a, make it move. Um, and again, trying to maintain that identity of the still image, because of course, it's very important for the viewer to understand and recognize what these images are, to be familiar with them, to see what they're familiar with in a different way, in a new way. Um, so um, this is, it was about five, six years worth of work to produce a five and minute and 45 um, second movie. And um, I didn't wear glasses when this process started and wore glasses at the <laughs> end just because of all of the tracing around the figures and all the detailed morphings, just staring at the screen. Um, so I wouldn't recommend this to anyone. Um, and, uh, excuse but, me, uh, yeah. how much did it change your sight? Oh, uh, well, uh, I needed immediately after doing this, it was when I had to get reading glasses, and then it's just sort of gone downhill from there. So. And uh, the glasses, which number of? Uh, uh, I honestly don't know. Uh -huh. Again, I don't know. Because so. I have the same problem. Yeah, you have the same problem, yeah. Just get away from the screen. <laughs> Focus on things far away. <laughs> and also, you know, don't, I just had spine surgery too from all of this, years of this stuff, so. Um, you don't do what I do. Um, so, uh, so, you know, again, um, does it succeed in, in doing what I'm hoping that it does, of, of sh giving you a simultaneous yet contradictory perception of something based on still images that are recognizable as the original still images from a different context that y yet seem to be moving, seem to be. Um, so. Very, um, I was very pleased with how that came out. So as my work has continued to move, I've explored still and moving images in other ways, uh, sometimes more conventional ways. Um, uh, Rotunda from 1910, after seeing some of my work um, at a, a residency that we were both attending, um, a composer, a musician composer, uh, from the University of Virginia named Judith Shatt, who's a very, um, pretty well-known composer in avant-garde music in the United States, um, invited me or asked me to collaborate with her on a project uh, uh, that she wanted to um, do related to this particular building, which I don't expect anyone to necessarily recognize. But this, is, uh, this building is known as the Rotunda that was designed by Thomas Jefferson as um, the centerpiece of the University of Virginia. Uh, which he also uh, founded um, and uh, was the first, um, it's interesting to me um, from a sort of political perspective because it was the first um, non-denominational liberal arts university in the United States. You know, Harvard and Yale preceded the University of Virginia, but they were all religious institutions. They were theological institutions. So this was an institution that was dedicated to um, learning, independent of any dogma. Um, and Jefferson chose a neoclassical design, going back to, not to a um, uh, medieval Christian past, but to the um, Republican past of ancient Rome uh, as the model. And so in this film, we wanted to sort of explore the timelessness of these ideals represented by this building and its history. I mean, nothing is terribly old in the United States, but this is one of the older buildings that still stands anywhere in the United States. Um, and yet it's surrounded by uh, constant motion of students. Um, uh, it's a very busy campus um, uh, and the cycle of days and seasons and semesters. So I, we wanted to sort of contrast the stillness of the building, in a sense, and what it represented with its situation in constant flux and constant temporal time passing. And so this appealed to me very much for the same reasons that you've seen in my other work. Um, so 
um, uh, we set up a still surveillance camera outside of her office, which was on a building facing the rotunda, that was remotely programmable. I was living in Boston at the time, but I could program that camera um, from my office in Boston. And so um, I could program different um, uh, shooting it. We shot it at what the device called scenes of a, a sequence of still images with a defined interval. And I could also adjust the zoom setting and some exposure settings. Um, at uh, different times throughout the day, um, always getting sunrise, always getting sunset, different times during the day, at different intervals, every day for an entire year. So here we actually ended up collecting something close to 400,000 still images. Uh, over this period of time. And so, um, and during that year, she recorded interviews with um, uh, officials and faculty and students at the university, um, uh, art historians, architectural historians, the president of the university. Um, and she also recorded some concrete sounds uh, surrounding and inside uh, the building. And she constructed, started to construct a soundtrack. So when we decided to put this together, of course, we had way too much material to work with. Um, and we decided upon a structure of presenting um, the year that passed as a day. So that dawn uh, is the beginning of the year, and sunset is the complete cycle returning to that month during the year. So midday or six months through the year. And that actually then dictated, uh, because of shadow, and so on, what you know, parts of the day we would use throughout that year. But again, to convey a sense of not only constant movement, but the cycle of the day, the cycle of the year in its relationship to that. So um, just to give you one little sort of idea of that. So essentially, however, it's a time-lapse movie. I'm working in a more conventional sort of mode here in that respect playing with ideas of time and temporality, stillness versus motion, but not in the same way to achieve some, uh, re retain the status or stature of the individual still images. Mm -hmm. um, what's happened to the sound? Oh, um, the, the, I have, there is, you have to come tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. This is just a little taste. Well, I'm sorry about that, it won't be. It won't, um, well, I hate to leave anyone I'm happy. Um, do I have time? Yes, maybe. Maybe not. I will just. Um, jump in somewhere here. Oh, do we have sound up? Oh, we'll see. Uh, so I think I'll just jump in. Well, let's go to like midday. Oh, that's graduation. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So that's what I see as the spiritual aspect of the rotunda. Well, you know, and 
I would say now we're, these ideals are also under threat. So um, it, uh, it was very easy for me to commit to working on this project because of those. Uh, yeah, I wanted to, so yes, it snows sometimes in Virginia. Uh, and of course the atmosphere changes were something very, you're thinking like an impressionist painter, I was very interested in those constantly changing atmospheric conditions. Yes. So, if, again, I invite you all to come tomorrow to see the whole film, but I need to move forward to get to the next film. Um, Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, so, well, that could, yes, okay. So, um, having worked with this high volume of stills uh, in the process of making Rotunda, I became, um, you know, so it opened up some new ideas, some new possibilities for me. Um, but, you know, the last couple of years, um, sort of prefacing the next film I want to get into, Highway 380 North, um, which is the film I had um, uh, screened at Split last year in the short film program. Um, I've been struggling to come, you know, to um, make new work um, for a while. I've been sort of um, finding myself, I think, increasingly falling off the curve of technical development. Um, I think I'm just getting old. Uh, finding less and less, uh, as things become increasingly more technically sophisticated, I find them less and less interesting and appealing. Um, often they seem to be inversely empty to their technical sophistication uh, to me. Um, and yet, I, I, so uh, too, too much time had passed without making something. Um, uh, I was actually uh, doing some, a lot of woodworking, um, again, working with my hands. Um, so I decided, uh, in fact, this is a little bit embarrassing uh, talking about a film that's actually done fairly well in some festivals, but um, I decided uh, one weekend that I was just going to make a film that weekend. I was just, uh, and I was going to use materials I had at hand. So this process started with uh, an absolutely, uh, a, a roll of one, a 100 foot roll of 16 millimeter film I shot in 1984 or three um, during a very cold winter day in Iowa um, during a blizzard that was terribly windy. And the camera, I was using a Bolex wind-up 16 millimeter camera, was jamming and not really working because it was just so darn cold, or my hands weren't working pressing the trigger. Um, so there were a lot of problems with the exposure of the film. And um, I never used it for anything. I, I, it was really sort of a, um, I don't know why I did it, um, and I, I never saw much use for it. And then um, sometime in the 90s, somebody offered me the opportunity, you know, somebody, I had a friend who was working in a lab and they said, hey, you want me to, I can transfer some stuff for you for free. This was when we were transferring things to standard definition DV video. So I actually had this film transferred to DV and the transfer was terrible. And that just sat for, on a DV tape for a long time. And I'll show you what the a sh one shot from that looks like in its DV transfer form. It's just dreadful drabish and had nothing at all like what I saw and wanted to try to capture when I was shooting it. There was something beautiful about the whiting, the, the snow blowing, and it sometimes becoming a, what we call a whiteout, where it just simply, the, the, what you see just disappears. I mean, it's just, you're just looking at essentially like a piece of paper just a, that just erased. And it was that idea of the, an image that was sort of coming into and away from your ability to perceive it that interested me, but the stuff never had those qualities. I never was able to. So I decided to work on this and, and decided to, if I was going to somehow create, re, return it to those qualities, re, rediscover those qualities, I, was, I couldn't do it working on it as a video. I tried applying effects to the video, but I've never really used effects. Uh, other than those I've achieved through the constructive process, like you know, using applying a, an effect filter, for example. They always look to be very arbitrary and inorganic, uh, or I'm just not any good at using them. Um, so I, I realized that if I was going to find something in this footage, um, I was going to have to sort of reconstruct it from the ground up. So um, I, I decided to embark on a process whereby I would um, convert it into still images, frame by frame. 
and then work on those still images as to try to return to them something of that now distant memory of what I had perceived. So now not only was I trying to, uh, like a drawing process, respond to something I was seeing, but now I was trying to reclaim something I had only remembered seeing. So I was working through this other layer of memory. Um, and so uh, the, this is the, I don't have that much time left, I'm sorry to say, but this is the process I kind of wanted to get into as my class part of this, but I can sum it up pretty quickly. So um, using some really rudimentary tools that I'm sure you're all familiar with, and probably many of you are better at doing all of this kind of stuff than, than I am, uh, basically I used QuickTime 7, I, I like some of its features, uh, and exported um, the uh, clip as an um, uh, image sequence. Uh, easy thing to do. Um, I'll just sort of go through the, the process as an overview and then get into some of the details and show you some of the results. So um, once it was an image, of course it was SD, it was 720 by 480 non-square pixel images, and you can't work with that anymore. I mean, there's really no viability to that format. And it was terrible quality anyway. So somehow I had to make the image bigger to bring it up to at least HD, but in some way to gain quality rather than lose quality, which is pretty not what normally happens. Um, so each image had to be cropped and to 16 by 9 and then resized to 1920 by 1080. Um, and then I used, um, not, did not work on it by hand, but in Photoshop, uh, I found I was more able to achieve certain effects that's, that seemed more organic to the image. And then working on them frame by frame, those effects would have some more uniqueness in each frame than they would have had if applied to a video clip. Um, so uh, essentially, um, I made it black and white. Um, I applied some filters going through. Uh, so this is, you know, save to image sequence. You saw the clip, at least one shot. Uh, in QuickTime 7, you can save it as Photoshop image to then go right into Photoshop. And you can also change the output frame rate. So the original 30 frame, 29.97 uh, NTSC video, I uh, exported at 60 frames. So it's actually creating new frames, interpolating and creating new frames out in their output. And that also is going to slow time down uh, for me. So um, going through this quickly, that's what a folder of those images now looks like. Uh, so then I bring them into uh, Photoshop. And you find a representative sample image to sort of test and play with and explore. And the process I came up with went through a lot of time and trial and error to achieve, test out and achieve the effects that I wanted to achieve. So um, cropping, um, making it more of a landscape image, resizing uh, the image, and then starting to apply filters. I don't know if you can see clearly here or not, but this is um, a dry brush filter effect that sort of posterizes it to some extent. Um, and then um, I added uh, another layer of filter, which I think was pastel chalk drawing or something like that, to give it a sense of sort of this kind of drawing, which is the way I always draw in the kind of drawing process. And I don't know if that's evident well enough in that frame to see. Um, and then, of course, adjust the exposure and, oops, um, and make it black and white. Um, and then take that, um, apply all of that. Um, once you have the sequence worked out and the, and the settings work, worked out, which I would do, uh, I'd readjust for each one of the separate sort of shots in the original film. Um, then, um, and you record all those actions in Photoshop. Then you can apply them as a batch to the entire folder of still images, saving them to a new folder where they're now saved in that format, and then re-import them into QuickTime 7 as an image sequence on input. And again, um, you can, um, in this case, I just, I used, um, you can, when, it, when you import, oh, that's, I'm actually exporting there. Um, you can also change the frame rate yet again. So I knew the project was going to be 24 frames per second. 
So I imported the clips at 24, which slows them down by 50% yet again. Um, so, uh, yeah. And then save that as a movie. <coughs> and so it looks kind of like this, that original clip that you saw. Mm -hmm. And I left in all of the um, exposure variations, the flash frames that are part of the film process, and all of the dust and scratches that, again, were evidence of the physicality of the film medium that disappears in digital. Um, and with that um, kind of drawing quality to make it seem like something that was being drawn as you watched uh, it to achieve that sense of process. Um, the soundtrack that I created was in my typical fashion, pretty much just sort of uh, what would appear to be natural sound effects, in this case, a lot of wind and passing truck noises, because um, that's pretty much what was happening. Um, and uh, there are moments in it when I combined the snow whiting out the image with the flash frames, so images would come and go out of visibility. Um, and this was so connected to oh, the idea of memory for me that, um, oh yeah, um, I decided to try to describe something of uh, my relationship to this image as something remembered in a somewhat fictional, somewhat autobiographical sense of, as if you were reading a passage from a diary. So I actually use a uh, typewriter effect to have the writing uh, the text appear as it's being written. So, um, let's see that again. <laughs> So again, um, it, it's a process where I find myself going back to something, trying to achieve a return to something very basic and elemental, something like a drawing that has that imperfect, unfinished quality that represents the process in uh, which it's sort of made. So that ends my Thank you. presentation. Thank you.